live in HD from the KGW studio on the square. This is Live at 7. And good evening, I'm Amy Troy. This is Live at 7, back for another special Saturday edition during the Olympics. On the show tonight, life on Mars, or at least the next best thing. Meet a Portland man who spent two weeks in a simulated Mars base in the middle of a Utah desert. We're back in the talk box tonight. Life on Mars, or at least a reasonably close facsimile. Portland author David Levine spent two weeks in January at the Mars Desert Research Station. That's in Utah. It's a project designed to simulate what astronauts would have to deal with setting up a base on the red planet. Yesterday, David stopped by our mothership on Jefferson and talked to Joe Donlin about the trip. David, this sounds a little bit like the biosphere too from my Arizona days. Mm -hmm. Tell me how it's different. You're assuming that there's already this pressurized space on Mars, correct? You're not in spacesuits at this time. Yeah, no, when we're inside the habitat, we're not we're, we're not wearing spacesuits while we're indoors. The idea is, is that this is a lander that would have been sent ahead and then we'd be living in it. Um, it's the size and shape of the lower stage of an actual launch vehicle. And then when we're living inside it, we are, um, not, we're, we've got normal pressure and we have food and water and all those usual things. We only have to wear spacesuits when we go outside. Okay, but it's not a greenhouse then, right? It's, tell us, walk us through how it's kind of set up, the size of it. The, uh, the habitat itself is about 30 feet in diameter and two stories tall. The picture up there is on the second story where we did all of our living. That was where the kitchen and the bedrooms were. And then downstairs are the science labs and the airlocks and all of the engineering and the one bathroom that the six of us shared. The six of you? Yes. And your, 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 uh, your summary at the end of this, what did you think of your experience there? It was amazingly intense. It was a great learning experience. I learned about being on my own, being out there where nobody else can help you. And we had a mission support that was available online and they could give us advice and instructions, but they couldn't make us do anything and they couldn't help us if we got into trouble. So we were really on our own. And that feeling of isolation and self-dependence was I think the most valuable thing that I learned. Okay, you've written a book, several books, and several mm -hmm. short stories. Mm -hmm. And the, the most recent one is called Space Magic. And I'm sure people watching this will say, that's really what this is, sort of a combination of science fiction and fantasy, but tell me it's a lot closer than, than that. Well, it really is. It, I mean, it's science fiction in that, we're, in that we're not really on Mars, but it's real science because we had, we had actual science experiments that we were doing. We had um, real space food, as it were. We had dehydrated food that we were eating, which was designed for lightweight because that's going to be a big problem. We had to deal with very limited water, very limited internet bandwidth, other limitations of things that we take advantage, we take uh, for granted sure. here on Earth. Let's just talk about the basics, though, David. How would we get there? How would we land? How would we get off of Mars, which is an even big? How would you build the terra? How would you terraform the area, the planet? There, there are so many things that people watching this might be thinking. Come on, seriously? Well, terraform <laughs> terraforming is, is is way in the future. But to get there, um, we can get there with the boosters and with the spacecraft that we have today. Now how long if would we, it take? About 200 days. Okay. 200 days each way, and then the mission would be either. 200 days there, 100 days on, and then 200 days back. Or if you wanted to stay there for a full Martian year, it would be 550 days on the surface. And how do you get back? Um, the, the plan, <laughs> there is the, that. the Mars Direct plan that this whole thing is based on is based on the idea that we would be landing a fuel factory ahead of the astronaut. So the fuel factory goes ahead and it sits there making fuel out of the methane in the Martian atmosphere. And that generates the fuel that you need to take off and get back. That's the hardest part of going to another planet is getting off of the other planet and getting back because every bit of fuel that you need to get back, you have to take with you. So la landing this fuel factory in advance is a way of getting around that problem. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh because it just sounds so hard to believe, but you think this might happen within how many years? I, no telling. I, I think it's not going to happen at all unless we have a national imperative, unless we have some reason to really want to invest the fairly substantial right, amount right. of money and resources that it would take. In, in the 1960s, of course, we landed on the moon because it was a whole national security, national mm -hmm. pride thing. We're going to need a powerful national motivation 
to do something like that again if we're going to reach Mars. I think it could happen this it could happen this century, might even happen in my lifetime, but really? it's not going to happen at all unless something in our political and economic situation changes it, changes to make it a priority. I heard there are aging astronauts who would volunteer to essentially make a one-way trip there to help work on this. Yeah, a one-way trip is certainly the most economical way of getting to Mars and learn and putting a person on Mars and learning about it. And I've been involved in discussions about whether it would be ethical to send someone on a one-way trip to Mars, even if they were a volunteer. And it's, you know, it ties in with assisted suicide and a lot of other things. I wouldn't sign up for it myself. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to spend the rest of my life on Mars, but I can think of plenty of people who would. Yeah, exactly. There wouldn't be a shortage, I don't think. Would mm -hmm. you be interested, though, when they get the return trip figured out? <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit of a homebody. This, was a, yeah. this, this, trip, to, this trip to Utah, this trip to Mars, was a, was a big adventure for me. Sure. And to do something like that for more than a couple of weeks, to do it for well, really, a couple of years, mm -hmm. including that, especially if you include the training time, is probably more than I'd be interested in doing. Yeah. David Levine, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great to meet you. One way trip to Mars. Wow. Well, there's more of the interview with David. We'll put the whole thing at kgw.com slash the square.